year I had 93 brood factories. So a brood factory is a, horizontal, is a, is a vertical nucleus colony with a narrow cavity. So there's only four combs in a box, but there's five boxes high. So they have 20 combs. There's like a double deep in the States, you know, 20, colon 20 combs. But they're, they're vertical. And, 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 and this year, from 93 brood factories, we harvested uh, uh, over 1,050 frames of brood in less than two months. And from that brood, we made uh, cell builders that provided 1,000 queens, and we made over 300 nu nucleus colonies. And it all came from the brood factories. And so I'm going to get into it, but I'm just saying that this is incredible, that you can harvest an average of 11 combs of brood from a colony. And in in middle of the summer, in the, high, in, the, in the sweet spot of the season, and still have a viable colony at the end that was going to go through our winter and build up and even make, make, make four, four or eight combs of honey. And so anyway, that's, uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Yes, it's going to be about brood factories. Uh, so <laughs> and <laughs> this cracks me up every time. I had no clue that this was happening. In, in uh, Latin America, from Mexico to Chile, they call my work the method, el metodo. <laughs> and it just like blows me away. I, I just, I did not know that people were watching and listening and I didn't know until I got there. <laughs> I mean, the lineup to take a photograph with me was three days long, you understand. So it was, it was, incredible, it was uh, rewarding, it was amazing. But that's what that means, El Metodo, and so I'm going to talk about El Metodo. So what is a brood factory? A brood factory, for me, is a, a um, vertically configured beehive, <clears throat> a, narrow, a narrow cavity, vertical. Not a horizontal like a National or a Langstroth or whatever, those are, verti those are horizontal, okay? And so I'm going to talk about how and how to manage them and a little more about uh, sustainability and like that. So can any style beehive be? Of course. Of course, any style of beehive can be um, a brood factor. Style meaning national, Langstroth, all these things, they all have different size frames. It doesn't matter. It's not the bee box that matters. It's what's inside the bee box that matters. And, um, and so... This is a little slide I, I, I made um, to just try to show you the importance of the brood factories in my operation. So brood factories, I mean, nucleus colonies are the building blocks of my apiary. Understand, I lost 60% of my, my production hives um, between last October and March. I lost 60% of, of my production hives. And not, not so many nucleus colonies, because they seem to, the first year they seem to um, overcome or outbreed Varroa, you know. But so we lost a lot. Now, if I didn't have nucleus colonies, if I didn't have those 300 nucleus colonies or 200 really nice survivors, I don't know what I'd do. I'd have to buy bees to fill up my dead beehives. Instead, I have nucleus colonies. So the nucleus colonies are supporting are supporting the production hives. And the production hives are giving breeding stock to the mating nuclei and the cell building nuclei. And the cell building and the mating nuclei and, uh, are giving queens to the nucleus colonies. And around and around and around. And so each corner of that triangle supports the other two. So when you have a, a loss in one place, you can use, you can, I could use the nucleus colonies to restock the, the mating nuclei if I have a, 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 a large loss of mating nucleus colonies, and et cetera. So, so that's, that's why I mean, that's why I say it's sustainable, because each part of my apiary supports the other parts of my apiary. And so I haven't had to buy bees or queens in decades because my brood factories and my nucleus colonies are giving me what I need, even when I have a major loss. So horizontal versus vertical configuration. So what am I talking about? 
horizontal configuration is a Langstroth or a National or whatever size. You have too many styles of beehives here. I can't keep it straight. But those are horizontal. And not horizontal like a, like a coffin hive or a top bar hive or something like that. That's really horizontal. But horizontal, meaning the combs are, are this way. And in order to raise brood, um, to expand the brood nest, the, bees first have, the, the colony first have to have enough bees to expand horizontally. The bees have to go out there and warm and polish and get the combs ready for the queen to lay. And so, you know, without the bees, they can't expand horizontally. Without the brood, they can't make the bees to expand horizontally. Whereas vertically, heat rises. And, uh, and uh, thermodynamics, okay, the heat rises. And so we, we harvest brood from the brood factories to do whatever it is we need it, wherever we need it in the apiary. And we, we add the combs, we add combs back to replace what we took. And, and it's within almost two weeks later, we're ready to harvest those combs and they have sealed brood already and maybe emerging brood. So the, the turnover is, is very fast. As I said, I mean, think about how many um, frames of brood I, I harvested from the brood factories. I mean, 11 combs average, that's amazing. So these are brood factories. These are horizontally configured brood factories. You know, there's, uh, there's two nucleus colonies in each bottom box. The bottom box is a double, is a double divided uh, bottom box with an entrance. Each, each nucleus colony has an entrance. Usually it's uh, on the right-hand side of, of the box. The, the nucleus colony on the right-hand side is the entrance, but then the entrance for this one would be on the other side. So they're, they're opposite each other. And they start the, they start the spring off with, with, three, with three boxes high, and, um, and we're adding to them all the time. And they build up five into five boxes high, sometimes six boxes high. You can't keep them in two boxes high, even three boxes high is not enough room, even though we're, we're harvesting brood from them constantly. Every 10 days or two weeks, we're taking more brood out of each of these nucleus colonies. But because it's vertical, they, they just, they fill up the frames of brood so, so rapidly, it's incredible. So as I said, this is my results from 2023. 93 brood factories. I harvested, now each, each cell building colony gets seven frames of emerging brood, 10 days before graft. So emerging brood, why? Um, if you know David Kemp in, um, in uh, well, he passed away last year, but he was, where was he from? Uh, yeah, and I told him I was using combs of brood, and he said, emerging brood? And I said, not necessarily. He said, emerging brood. So what I'm doing is I'm building, I'm building a nurse bee population. That's my intent, is to build nurse bee population in the cell building colony. So we have an overabundance of nurse, bee, of nurse bees to take care of the queen cells, to grow the queen cells. So each, each, each uh, cell builder gets seven frames of emerging brood on, on day one. Day 10, we graft. So they have 10 days for that emerging brood to emerge and get old enough to be proper nursing bees. So that's 364 frames of brood. And then we, have, we made 305 nucleus colonies. And each of them gets, well, the, 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 the nucleus colonies made in June, between, say, June 13th is about the first queen catch, and, and July 1, they get, each get two frames of uh, brood, a, a frame of open and a frame of, of sealed and a honey and an empty comb. But once we get past the 1st of July, we need to uh, give more brood because our flow ends at the end of the lime flow, and that's about the middle of July. And in order for them to build a colony, a, a, a really strong colony, maybe draw some foundation out, they have to, get, they have to be made, they have to build that population before the flow ends. 
And so the, one, the, the nucleus colonies made between, say, the, um, the 1st of July and the 10th of July, when we're all done, um, have to have an extra frame of brood so that the population is increased and so they can, uh, they can, they can expand. They have a better population and they can draw some foundation. And otherwise, they can't because the flow ended. So 305 nucleus colonies we made, and that was 700 frames of brood, considering the, the two frames in the, in the June made and the, and the three frames in the July made nucleus colonies. So that's 1,064 a, a frames of brood from 93 brood factories, which equates to 11.4 combs of brood harvested from each. So you know, that's, that's considerable, and that's the average. So there's some less and some more. So I bet there's some that maybe gave us 15 frames of brood in that two-month period between May 9th, and this year was the 13th because we were delayed by weather, and the 8th of July when we're done. <clears throat> That's pretty amazing, I think. So with vertical configuration, in the double nuke boxes, we have more queens laying. Okay, so it's one standard size Langstroth, you could do it in your beehives too, with a divider in the bottom box. And so you've got the same footprint as a, as a standard, your standard beehive, except you've got two queens laying. They're separated, they're not together, they're separated, but there's less resources. You've got the same size stand in the same bottom in the uh, size bottom and the same size lid and everything fits together so you don't have to make special lids and special bottoms and all that so you have two queens laying in the same footprint as as you would with a standard beehive one of the issues with uh, beekeeping is the boxes get heavy when they're when they're full of bee uh, full of honey but these are only four comb boxes so a four comb box only weighs maybe 25 pounds if it's full of brood. I mean, if it's full of honey, that's not very heavy. Pretty much anybody can pick up a 25 pound box and handle it. And so that's one of the advantages of these, uh, of these double uh, nucleus colonies raised at, used as uh, brood factories. So this is a brood factory um, building a population. Um, Here's the entrance, the main entrance. Uh, there's some auger hall entrances, which they much prefer. They love the auger hall entrances. Um, I, I like to try to keep them, uh, this, this is, like, there's still snow on the ground here, so this is fairly early. But um, I like to keep these plugged with a piece of duct tape so that they use the bottom entrance. I don't know if you've ever noticed, but bees like to put their brood near the entrance. I don't know if you've noticed that. Um, and so I don't really want, want the brood up in this part of the, of the colony. I want brood in this part of the colony. And so by keeping those closed, they locate the brood nest lower in the hive, which is what I'm trying to do. That's why. So we can use um, this brood that's harvested from brood factories to boost your weak colonies. Um, you know, honey production is maximized when the population of the colony is maximized at the beginning of the honey flow. And so by adding frames of brood to colonies that are, are slow, um, you build that population and you get them ready for the honey flow. Um, for strengthening cell builders, as I said, each cell builder gets seven combs of brood. And, um, and 10 days later we graft. Ten days later, we harvest the cells, and that same day, we set up. We do, we do another setup. We set up the exact same colony, the exact same cell building colony, with seven more frames of brood. And some of them, they get. The, we do this three times. So we've added 21 combs of brood to this cell builder. You can imagine the population of nurse bees in the thing. I've had. I found taken some apart before and found 15 frames of brood below the queen excluder. Okay below the queen, 15 frames of brood. And seven of them are open brood. So how are, are we actually allowing um, our queens to reach their full potential? Is, the, is, the, uh, is, is limiting the population of the colony, limiting the, the 
the performance of the queen? Yes, I think so. And then for starting nucleus colonies. So we start you know, hundreds and hundreds of nucleus colonies. So boosting slow colonies. So imagine that if you had a slow colony, you need a colony that's got eight or, eight or 10 frames of brood um, at, at the beginning of the flow. That's going to build the population. But you've got colonies that have four or five frames. They'll make a super or two of honey, but they're not going to make the, the 100 plus pounds of honey. They're not going to make the 160 pounds of honey like we, ha like, like we had this year. But by adding combs of brood like that, it boosts that population right away. And now they're ready for the flow. Strengthening cell builders. So this is the, 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 the photograph on the left is the cell builder. This is the box where the emerging brood was added. So you've got, you've got the colony with a honey super, queen excluder, second honey super, future cell building colony. And when the colony is taken apart day 10 after, after adding the brood, there's no more larvae up here. It's all, been, it's all been sealed. We take it apart, the colony apart. We put the colony, the, this, the queen right colony, on the ground facing the other way. We just slide it around, turn it around on the, on the point of the corner of, this, of the uh, bottom board. And then, um, and then we uh, make sure there's no cells, but then we shake bees out of the queen right section of the, of the colony into the cell building part. The cell building is, it has the queen, has the, the honey super on the bottom board and the future cell builder on top. And we make sure there's no queen cells in it because there can't be queen cells in it. And then we, um, then we shake the, the core of the brood nest which is where the nurse bees are, actively nursing, through a queen excluder into now the cell builder is out front on its own stand and the queen right is behind facing the other direction. And this is the kind of a population we build. A huge population. But that's what I consider I need for raising proper queen cells. So the nurse bee population is maximized by adding combs of emerging brood. You know, the quality of the queen is all about jelly. It's all about royal jelly. How much royal jelly did that, did that larva pupa eat? How much did they get fed? How do you boost the amount of jelly in the cell? I mean, the cells are still full of jelly on day 10 when you harvest the cells. How do you get that position? By maximizing the population of nurse bees. And the whole thing is about the jelly. The whole thing on raising quality queen cells is about the jelly. And so we get queen cells like this. This is uh, about day, maybe day six after graft. Um, and look at, this, look at the cups. They're, I mean, they're just full of jelly. Look at the cells. They're just, they're gorgeous. And this is because of the nurse bee population that is so huge and the, and the, and the worker bee population that's so huge. They just can't help but make queen cells like that. Starting the nucleus colonies. Um, these, are, these are the brood factories. Uh, these are future brood factories. You know, most of my nucleus colonies in the past were wintered in, um, in two stories, two levels. So there'd be, this is a nucleus colony with two levels, so that's only eight combs, and we add, we add additional boxes. Now I winter the brood factories in three stories, in 12. And the brood from, out, from making all, this, uh, all these you know, cell builders and boosting weak colonies and, and making nucleus colonies, where does that brood come from for all this management? It comes from brood factories. The brood factories are producing me and giving me all this brood that I need from vertically configured brood factories, which are cranking out frame after frame after frame after frame. It's incredible how fast they fill combs of brood. And I've, I've been talking to people pretty much around the world who have taken up this brood factory uh, work, and they're all saying the same thing. They say, wow, I can't believe how fast they're filling combs of brood. So this is what I'm trying to get at. You know, try it. Try one. Try one. You don't need to do the double box. Just try a nucleus colony, vertically configured, and see if, if I'm not correct. And I am. <laughs> I know I am, because I've been doing it for 20 years. 
at least. So I'm going to have uh, some slides here, and I'm trying to, um, to show you um, uh, the progression of the combs of from empty to, uh, to larvae to open brood, brood in all stages, bias, you know, all these things. Each one is going to have its own color. And so we start with strong overwintered nuclei. These are nucleus colonies in, uh, in May. Uh, dandelions are still in bloom. It's, it's still early. I haven't cut the grass yet. Um, and we add more additional, additional stories, additional four comb supers to them. And so this is what a typical overwintered nucleus colony would look like. They're not all the same. They're, they're a little bit different. Um, this is the divider between two nucleus colonies. And you can see that they're not all the same. Um, this one's got a comb of honey. It's only got one comb of honey left. A couple frames of mixed brood and a frame of capped. And a, and a frame of mixed brood and a frame of capped and nectar pollen and an empty comb. This one's a little different. It's got two combs of honey and two combs of, of capped, three combs of capped and a, and a comb of oh, mixed. And so they're all a little bit different because, you know, bees are different. Every colony is different. So then we add the third story to them. And we want to put a third story on that's four combs. So we're going to add four dark brood combs to the colony. Well, where do we put that? Well, if we're on a flow and we put them up here, what's going to happen to four combs uh, on top of a colony? They're going to fill it with nectar. They're on a flow. That's not what I want. I want brood. So we put, we put at least two of the combs in the sweet spot. Now, the sweet spot in double nucleus colonies is against the divider. Because remember, there's two nucleus colonies, and they're sharing heat. So this is not the center of the brood nest. This is the center of the brood nest. So this is the sweet spot in, the, in, in her center, and that's where she's going to lay. So we'll, we'll put two combs of, of uh, two nice empty brood combs here, and maybe two up here to handle the, the flow, the incoming flow. So you can see, we just we moved two combs here. And we moved it up into another box with two empty combs, put two empty combs here, and she goes right there. She goes right there and lays. So in, in two weeks from now, I can come back and find frames of brood there, sealed brood. So this is what they look like once, once they're getting built up into uh, brood factories, three high. And when that goes, as that other photograph showed, they go four high, they go five high, sometimes six high. It depends on the colony, it depends on their strength, it depends on how quickly we get back you know, we need enough room there for them to, uh, to have a place to lay, for her to have a place to lay, but also combs above for, um, for honey storage, so it all has to be there. I don't produce honey with these, a little bit. I'm not trying to produce honey because I'm pulling brood out all the time. Uh, my, friend in, uh, my friend from Colombia, he's, in, uh, he's on an island called uh, San Andres uh, off the coast of Honduras, but he's uh, Colombian. And, um, and he's the one that named it, this thing El Metodo. <laughs> he's, the, he's the one. He's to blame. But <clears throat> he, made, he made, this year, he made a record honey crop for Colombia with nucleus colonies. So it's possible. I've, I've seen, uh, seen three-story nucleus colonies, two-story nucleus colonies with an excluder and supers stacked right up. So that's possible, too. I'm not trying to do that. I'm trying to grow brood. Um, so after adding combs, this is that, the same slide I had before. Now I'm looking for emerging brood because I'm setting up cell builders. So you see what was at one time was, was uh, mixed brood, brood in all stages, um, has become emerging brood. Because the next time we went back, this one is now emerging. This one is now emerging. But anyway, if we don't get back there in time, the brood hatches from the comb, and they, she lays in it again, and it becomes mixed brood, brood of all stages. So that's the progression. So if we're going to, if we're going to find two frames of, uh, of uh, emerging brood and a comb of honey, remember every nucleus colony gets two frames of brood 
and a frame of honey, or the cell builders get seven frames of emerging and two frames of honey. So we harvest one frame of honey and two frames of emerging, and we replace it with empty comb, and we replace the, we, we move the comb around a little bit, and so we can put two empty combs in the sweet spot, and maybe another empty comb up here to replace that frame of honey that we took, and they'll fill it up again because they're on a flow. But that gives her plenty of room here for to lay. And so in the next 10 days to two weeks, she's filling that up. She's got a place to lay. They're happy. They're not going to swarm because I'm staying ahead of them. You know, last year we had 120 brood factories, and we couldn't stay ahead of them. We just couldn't get back there in time. And so too many of them started swarm cells. Some of them did swarm. And so, yeah, so then we're, we're replacing what we took and putting them in the proper place. And that's how, once we harvest the brood, well, that's, then that's how we replace those. Now, if you're adding foundation, foundation is pretty much the same, you know? Foundation, um, I like to use brood comb when I'm trying to uh, uh, grow brood. But sometimes I run out of brood comb, or, or they need more room, they need a fourth box, or sometimes a fifth box, and they don't have the combs to use, so I have to use foundation. Again, you put the, you put the, uh, the foundation in the sweet spot. So you see, here's the foundation, and the foundation. So I've added a fourth box, four combs. I put two foundations in the sweet spot, two foundations up in the top on the outside, which are going to be drawn out and filled with nectar. And these two are going to be drawn out and filled with, with brood. Yes, yeah, so there's emerging brood here as well. Emerging brood. I'll harvest those frames of emerging brood, replace them with empty comb, etc. You know, the mixed brood, again, the next, the next time around, the mixed brood has become emerging. The capped brood has hatched out, has emerged. And because it's in the top, they fill it with nectar and pollen and so forth. And so that's the progression between the combs of, of brood and, and, and empty comb and combs of foundation. And when you're harvesting, are you just shaking the bees off? No, we're not. We're taking the bees with us. And how, how do you check? You just visually check for the queen? Or? Visually check for the queen. Okay. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, every once in a while, uh, you take <laughs> one. And then, so now you put... If you put that comb in a cell builder, and 10 days later you go back to do the graft, and uh-oh, there's a queen in the cell building colony. In the, it, and you can't have a queen in the cell building colony. Also, I don't want open brood in the cell building colony, because I want the cell building colony to have no open brood, so that when I put my graft in the cell building colony, the only 48 larvae that they have to this huge population has are the 48 grafts that I give them. And they jump on it, poof, and they just build it right up. So that's the progression. So then, once we have mated queens, so we have, uh, if I start my cell, building, uh, cell builders on May 9th, my first queens come out on, on June 13. So we start making nucleus colonies on June 14 with two frames of brood, a frame of emerging, a frame of sealed, a frame of honey, and an empty comb for, for expansion. Why, why not to just two frames of brood, two frames of sealed brood? <clears throat> because sealed brood doesn't hold bees. So when you make 50 nucleus colonies and you take them to an apiary and put them on the ground and give them queens, some of those colonies are, are much stinkier, should I say. The bees, the bees, the pheromones are stronger, and bees will drift from the other 49 nucleus colonies that just got put down on the ground into the one that's, that's got stronger pheromones. It, that, that, it smells better. They love it better. And you'll have a huge beard on the outside of that one the next day. And so we have to equalize the bees. I have a, a little iced tea scoop container that I use as a scoop and you know but so we have to equalize the brood so on day um, after we um, we put cells in the uh, in the mating nuke 16 days later we catch the queens so this is a typical catch we do 128 mating nukes every four days 
And sometimes we have over, we catch over 100 queens from that group, and sometimes we only get a 50% take. So it varies all the time. Don't ask me why. We have tried everything. We have looked at everything. And it just doesn't make any sense at all. Everything is the same, made the same, they got the same queens, they got the daughters, I mean, their sisters, I mean, and you get a 50% take instead of a 85% take, right? I don't know. I don't have a clue. I guess I'm just not intelligent enough to figure it out. But that's the way it is. So once we have queens, we can start making nucleus colonies. This is gonna be around, if we're on schedule, it's about the 13th or 14th of June, or the first, or the first. And so we make nucleus colonies, and I said you'd have two frames of brood and a comb of honey and like that, and, a, and an empty. So this is a typical, typical um, colony. <clears throat> this one had two, two boxes of honey. So now we have four boxes of honey or three or combs of honey or three combs of honey that we can use to make nucleus colonies. So these are the nucleus colonies that are being made up today with a frame of honey against the divider. Isn't that crazy? You, we would think you would want to put them on the outside against the sidewall. That's the way bees do it, right? They don't like this, this honey in the center. Here, okay, here's the center of the, of the double nuke box. They don't like honey there. And I'm not talking about a big frame of capped crystallized honey. I'm talking about a rim of capped and maybe a lot of nectar. And they'll move that honey. They'll move that right out and put it somewhere else. And th remember, it's the sweet spot. And she'll jump right on that. And 10 days later, there's brood in that comb. <clears throat> and so each one gets you know, a honey, a mixed, a capped, and an empty comb. And that's the start of a nucleus colony for me. And we make whole apiaries of these things. These were probably made, almost all made on the same day. And we give them a queen, same day. We make them, take them to the apiary, give them a queen. I don't believe in this. Oh, you wait four days or you wait seven days and you cut out the emergency cells. Why would I want to do that? It's just adding to my workload. So you give them, the, in two hours at, at, at the most, the bees know they're queenless. And you put, the, you put a queen cage, a caged queen, on top of the top bars in a newly made nucleus colony, and you watch the parade. It's just like, oh my god, oh, we're in love. And, that, and they do, and they, and they accept that immediately. So this year, you know, we usually make 300 to 350 nucleus colonies. In that, in that four week period or whatever it is, give them a queen the same day, and we have about four or five nucleus colonies that reject their queen. Why would you want to wait days and have to cut queen cells out? You don't have to wait. Put it in there right now and avoid that. So we've gone through the season. This is what they look like after, the, after nucleus colonies were made. There, we're, not, we're not harvesting any more, any more brood. When, we harvest, uh, when we we're done harvesting brood on the last, uh, on the last catch, uh, removal of brood, harvest of brood, we're trying to leave three or four combs of brood in the bottom box. And uh, here we've had to add some foundation because we've still got the autumn flow coming which can be really big, and we let them build up. And so by the time they're done um, with the autumn go uh, goldenrod aster flow, they look something like this. So now they have one, two, three, four combs of brood, two boxes of honey, which is they don't need two boxes of honey for winter, so we'll harvest that box. And then if they need additional feed, we'll feed them additional feed. So this one is ready for harvest over there. So you see we've harvested a box of honey. And so this is what we're, we wind up with. A box of honey on top and two combs of honey here. After they go through that, that, uh, that autumn flow, I'd like to see them winter with two boxes of honey and perhaps some honey out here, nectar pollen, honey, whatever. And, and if they don't have two boxes of honey, 
They need to be fed. And so to, to fill a box like this that's half honey, we need about a gallon of syrup, about 10 pounds of syrup. If this one was light, if the top box was light, and th then the, body, the middle box will be very light. So we might need one box of, of syrup to fill up the top box and two gallons of syrup to fill up the middle box. So we wind up feeding them three gallons of syrup. So that's, you know, we don't weigh them. We have to, because they're doubles, we can't weigh individual nucleus colonies. So you kind of pick up the top box and you get, a, you get an idea. Is it full? Is it heavy? Or is it kind of half full? Or is it empty? And then you can judge, you know, just by lifting how much syrup these things need for winter. So what am I doing with these bees? We start off in the spring and we build them up. And we build them up, and we add additional boxes, and then we start harvesting brood for, for um, cell building, but we're still building them up. We're still giving them combs. We're still letting them uh, expand the brood nest with brood and, and the population. And then once we get done with cell building, we start to create nucleus colonies, and eventually we start knocking them down from six and five comb uh, boxes down to three boxes and we knock them down and we create nucleus colonies and we knock them down and we create nucleus colonies and we wind up leaving, leaving three or four combs in the bottom two boxes of brood and then we let them go. So they become perennial. So these nucleus colonies are perennial. They live from year to year to year. They do very well. You know, they, um, nucleus colonies um, tolerate varroa mites better than full production colonies. We learned this back in the Acherine time when it was from about the end of the 80s to maybe 95 or so. We were having a real issue with Acherine. We're losing half our bees every spring, you know, to, to tracheal mites, Acherine. And, um, and so we'd make these double nukes and winter them on top of production hives for the, for the additional heat, which I found out isn't necessary, but with, for the additional heat. And in the springtime, the production colony would be dead from tracheal mite, from acarine. And the two nucleus colonies would be alive and thriving. I think in the case of, of acarine, the, um, the bees are outbreeding the tracheal mite. Tracheal mite, acarine, is, is an adult bee disease. So brood that's emerging doesn't have acarine, doesn't have tracheal mites. And so you have the, this colony cranking out all this brood, and there aren't enough tracheal mites in there to infest the colony the first winter, the first spring, and so you have these beautiful colonies coming out when the production colony died. Well, I think the same thing is happening with varroa mites. Because we find very low mite loads. You know, out of the 100 nucleus colonies in the program last year, there were eight colonies that had more than 2% varroa mite. That's pretty amazing. This year, it was four, and we reduced the the treatment threshold from 2% to 1%. And we only had four colonies, four nucleus colonies, that were over 1%. You can't see that in a production hive, though. So I think the same thing is happening. As long as you start your nucleus colonies from a, a brood source that has a low infestation rate, the, the bees in the nucleus colonies are going to outbreed the, the varroa mites. And so the varroa mites aren't going to overwhelm that colony the first year and, the, and, and into the spring. If you pull 11 frames of brood out, you'd be doing mite trapping in the brood too. That, that's true. So yes, so if there are um, varroa mites at any significant numbers in the brood factories, yes, we're removing brood all the time. So we're removing the brood from the brood factories, but also, but, but not from the regular nucleus colonies that we just created. So that's why I'm saying that they, they seem to be able to outbreed the, the varroa mites. Anyway, that's really what we're doing. That's really what I'm using these colonies for, is they're just, just a a brood source, you know, for everything I need in my apiary, from all the three corners of that, of that triangle, is being supported 
by my brood factories. You know, the nucleus colonies, think about it, that I lost 60% of my production hives, and I still went on to make a beat 100 pound average of honey production. That's incredible. I would be out of business, or I would be bankrupt if I had to go buy bees to replace a 60% loss in my apiary. But I have the bees in my apiary. The nucleus colonies overwinter better than the production colonies. So I have bees. I don't have to buy bees to restock my hives. Now I made, what did I make? From 220 or something, I made 12 tons of honey this year. That's pretty good. It's a pretty good, pretty good average. That's a pretty good uh, goal. So anyway, those are brood factories. Thank you. My observation regarding um, Varroa and the lack of in your um, factory is also a drone brood. You've no, or very likely have no drones. Very little, that's true. And that is going to impact that certainly as helps. well as Randy said on drawing out mm -hmm. and in fact infecting your for, main for colonies. Sure. With but I will say that um, the standard nucleus colonies that I make, and this is their first summer and they're building up, they have almost no drone brood. Yeah. But the brood factories that are perennial, in, indeed. they do, indeed. Have, they do uh, have significant amount yeah. of brood, uh, drone brood. I just wanted to ask, um, when you're making up your, um, your mating nucleuses and you're putting your honey uh, frame next to the sweet spot, mm -hmm. why, what, I didn't quite understand why you put it there when the bees are just going to move the honey out because um, that's the sweet spot where the queen lays, likes to lay the most. But why are you going to make the bees work to move that honey out? I, I don't, it just seems to work better. Okay. I, I don't, sometimes I don't really know what I'm doing, but I know the results, so, <laughs> so I don't know why. That's the thing, I don't know why. I no longer run the number of colonies I used to. What's the minimum number that I could practice your method? Uh, two. The number of uh, I, I mean, not many. Um, you know, you could, have, uh, you could have a brood factory, and if, what if you had, maybe if you had 10 frames of uh, 10, 10 colonies, you would have enough brood to, to boost the population. It depends. I don't know if you're, if you're planning on raising your own queens or if you're planning on buying your own queens. You know, if you're raising your own queens, it takes more brood, obviously. So it's hard to, for me to say how many. So it really is going to depend, and it's something you need to investigate and you need to practice yourself. It's different here than, wow, is it different here than where I live as far as climate goes. So, you know, if I had 10 frames of, of, uh, of bees for honey production, I would, I would have at least one or two uh, brood factories. And don't forget, um, you're going to have a loss in that, 10, in that 10 colony apiary. How are you going to replace that? Are you going to replace it with bought bees? Or are you going to replace it with brood and bees out of a brood factory? So it really is going to depend on, on what you want. Mike, what do you think causes your level of winter losses? Mostly varroa mite, I would say. Mostly varroa. A little queenlessness but not much. Starvation, almost never, because I, you know, I, I feed them enough in the fall to get them through until, say, April. You know, April is, you know, my, my April, we have, we have no cleansing flights from November until April. None. They don't even come out of the high. They can't poop. They can't do anything. Could you speak more about the practical aspects and the time constraints of actually doing this sort of system, especially with the number of nuclei colonies that you've got? I mean, are you having them really close to your house so you can track them very regularly? Um, how does that impact you practically? Um, you mean how far away they are and everything and traveling? And yes, and uh, your you inspections know, They're all are within more... my county. I used to have bees in New York State when it would be a 45-minute drive, you know, each way. And I, I, I sold off my New York bees. I just, I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't, I, I, too much time, I'm getting too old for that. So I, now I keep all of my bees in our county. So my, my longest drive is going to be 15 minutes, you know. But so we have, uh, I have around 20 apiaries. I've got uh, one cell building apiary. 
and in that apiary are about 60 brood factories. And I have another apiary that's got around 40 brood factories. And then we have uh, four, four or five um, apiaries that are only for nucleus colonies. They're not production hives, so is that what you wanted? More about, because it seems that this takes a lot of time, yeah. this sort of method. All of my time. Yeah, so what percentage of your time is dedicated to th this sort of um, oh, work in comparison sure. to production so, and your other Yeah, ventures? so from, um, we have a lot of work to do before cell building can start and nuke making can start. So if cell building starts on, uh, on May 9, <clears throat> the whole schedule isn't being performed starting on day one, you know. You know, it's, a, it's an eight-day schedule, so day one is cell builder setup, um, day three is grafting, uh, but the first week we don't have any grafts, right, because they're not ready yet. And so there's a schedule that takes around almost two weeks before the whole program is running. Uh, from that point on until the final um, uh, nucleus colonies are made uh, uh, this year was July 8th, it's nonstop, full time, everybody I can get to work with me, I, I need it. So, but then it starts to slow down. So June 30 is the last graft, so now there's no more grafting. Um, uh, June 10th is the last queen cells. So now there's no more, now there's no more cell stuff, no more setups, no more cell builder setups, something like that. So it starts early and slow and it builds up to this peak and then it goes along for you know, a month, and then it starts to slide, slide down on the other end. So, but it's, and then we're managing for, you know, we have to do requeening. So everything has to be requeened. If they have a, a, a low performing queen or an older queen, especially in a brood factory, I want the, the, the most prolific and the youngest queen. So if there's a two year old queen in a brood factory, I've had her in there for two years. She's been making me brood for two years. She's done, even though she's doing well now, because I don't want a failing queen or a slow queen next spring. I want them, you know, able to fill up the brood for frames that I give them. So, yeah, it builds up, it plateaus on, on too much work, and then it goes back down the other end. Mike, with all the uh, uh, brood comb moving and all the manipulations, what precautions do you take against spreading disease from colony to colony? Well, we're looking for disease all the time. And um, we really don't have a disease problem. I haven't seen American fowl brood in years and years. We've got a little bit of uh, EFB started. I think you said, mentioned something about a new strain of EFB. Yes, I believe I'm seeing this. And it doesn't look like traditional EFB. It looks like sort of chalk brood or, or parasitic mite syndrome, you know, or chalk brood or, or um, EFB, and it's really hard to tell. Now, you can get a test and test for it, but we almost never see it. But we're allowed to use antibiotics with a, with a veterinary prescription. So if I, if I find a nucleus colony, or something, a brood factory, or whatever. They're out of production. And then we have to treat with teramycin. And we are allowed to do that where I am. And that clears it up. Pre pretty well clears it up. Occasionally you get a repeat, but not, not often. So that's what we do. We never, I haven't seen American fowl brood in decades. So we really don't have... Um, we don't have the incidence of, of brood disease. Um, <clears throat> chalk brood, I never see chalk brood anymore. You know, testing for hygienicness. Um, if you have hygienic bees, you know, however you measure that, frozen brood assay or whatever. Um, once you have hygienic bees, you will never see chalk brood again. I sent my, my bees to Florida in 1998. That was the, one of the worst mistakes I ever made in my beekeeping career because they came home rotten, stinky rotten with, with chalk brood. And requeening <coughs> chalky colonies with hygienic bees, you know, you don't know this, these people, but uh, from uh, Pat Heitgem and Heitgem's Carney Owens, he, he was one of the very first to start selecting for hygienic bees. Wow, in a month from stinky rotten 
and piles of chalk root on the bottom board to none. But I couldn't find one in a month. Gone, and for gone forevermore. We might find, we don't find a handful of chalk root colonies anymore in a year. So yeah, we're looking all the time. But with hygienic bees, you know, a lot of the brood diseases are taken care of. It doesn't seem that they take care of uh, EFB so well, <clears throat> but it's, it's sealed brood that they know. They know it and they rip it out. They rip out the chalk brood mummies before they're ever contagious.